Um, hello and welcome to Global Sports Care. Uh, my name is Dr. Markus Laubheimer, and today I invited a, a special friend, um, Professor Nat Padia from Queen Mary. Hi, Nat. Hi, Marcus. Nice to be here. Nice to see you too. Uh, Nat, can you tell um, the viewers uh, what you're doing at the moment um, in London, uh, your work and your responsibilities at Queen Mary? Yeah, um, my job is uh, divided into two clinical and academic. Uh, it has been uh, for the last uh, 35 odd years. Um, I've just recently been appointed as a professor, honorary professor uh, of podiatric sports medicine. Uh, it is a, a new subject that we've started offering uh, as a course at uh, postgraduate certificate level diploma and an MSc in conjunction with sport and exercise medicine. Um, that's been going for about four or five years. So that's my academic uh, um, attachment. Uh, but clinically, I work in the private sector, uh, both in uh, Harley Street as well as uh, in East London at London Independent Hospital. Uh, my background is uh, uh, podiatric surgery, uh, but uh, podiatric sports medicine is uh, growing in, uh, in interest as well as uh, in uh, occupation. So, yeah. so there are many conditions you can deal conservatively rather than surgically. And um, our, our video today is about um, exercise-induced leg pain. And I know you're very passionate about this over the last, um, um, I know you at least for 10 years. Um, um, and uh, since ever I know you and, and I came to your lectures, uh, you were quite um, um, negative about the term shin splints. And uh, can you tell uh, why you do hate this term so much? Um. My interest uh, in leg pain dates back to probably about 85, 86, uh, when I first got to know Dave Perry, who you know well. Uh, he's a rheumatologist and uh, together with uh, John King, uh, who I'm going to give this uh, tribute to in a minute. Um, and we discussed uh, what shin splints meant. And I think in those days we were all naive uh, because uh, the knowledge base uh, regarding exercise induced leg pain was very limited. And shin splints was a terminology that was used. And unfortunately it's been continued to be used. Uh, and the reason why I hate it the most is because it's used as a diagnostic term, but it means so many different things. If you allow me, Marcus, I'm, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, first thing I'd like to do is pay tribute to uh, Professor John King, who again, you know, you know, and a lot of people listening to this lecture would also know. Uh, he was an academic pioneer, uh, consultant orthopedic surgeon uh, by background, but a great mind, a great uh, knowledge, uh, knowledgeable gentleman. And, and he uh, and I worked uh, since January 1989 uh, when he invited me to be a lecturer in his department, which, uh, by the way, celebrates 40 years this year. He started it in 1981, so we're going to have a big party after our scientific uh, conference. So anybody who's listening to this, uh, make a note. Uh, 10th, uh, 11th of September, uh, we're going to have a black tie dinner to celebrate this event. And he had an interest in leg pain, and we often had discussions on a weekly basis. We worked together both in NHS and privately, in fact, right next to each other. So I owe a lot of the, <clears throat> the knowledge I have, <clears throat> excuse me, about leg pain to uh, my colleague, mentor, and a very good friend, John King. Um, <clears throat> I think it goes without saying that if all the knowledge you have is shin splints and compartment syndrome, that's equally just as bad. And I'll come to clarify that in a minute. So it's a bit like a hammer and a nail situation. Um, if all you see is shin splints, that's how you're gonna deal with it. And you just go to Google shin splints and you'll find 
millions of kids. You Google, you put shin splints in a PubMed and you'll find a handful of literature uh, papers. Uh, so there, there is a, a kind of a disconnect between what's evidence and what's, uh, uh, I would say a myth. Uh, shin splints is a terrible terminology. Um, all due respect, clinical community uh, since 1968 has tried to, to define what shin splints is. And as this AMA definition shows, uh, they failed miserably. And they failed miserably because it takes care of so many different structures. It doesn't actually tell us uh, about exactly what it is. And I think in this current climate of evidence-based practice, uh, it makes sense that we actually define it a bit more. But it is one of those terminologies which you simply cannot define uh, specifically. And that's where the problem lies. And that's why I hate it the most. Um, here's a prime example. I've got hundreds of these referrals. Um, here's a, in one letter, requires shin splints. So this is a 35 year old lady who requires shin splints. What does that mean? What do I give her? A bit of shin pads? Same letter has shin pain and physio recommended shin splints to be fitted. So what would you actually fit? Uh, because what shin splints actually means, it's an anatomical terminology. Shin refers to tibia. Fibula, as we know, is a splint bone. If tibia doesn't have a fibula, uh, tibia, is put under immense stress through the knee and through the ankle because it forms a ring. So it's it's a splint bone. So splint refers to tip, uh, fibula. If you look at any uh, anatomical book, uh, especially Graves, that's exactly what shin splints means. And Marcus, that is why I hate it because it's it's an anatomical term. It's it's actually not a clinical term. And this letter tells you uh, why it is so confusing. And equally, compartment syndrome. Often patients come to me petrified. I've been told by my doctor or my <clears throat> physiotherapist or podiatrist that I've got compartment syndrome. What do, what do patients do today? First thing they do is Google it. If you Google compartment syndrome, these are the pictures you get. And there are 23 and a half million of these hits on Google. So it's not surprising that patients get petrified. If, is this what I have? They don't read these articles. Compartment syndrome is synonymous with acute compartment syndrome, which is a totally different beast to what we see in sports medicine. What we see is chronic exertional compartment syndrome. It is not limb threatening. It is not life threatening, totally reversible. Uh, and many patients modify their activity and can be pain-free. So I think the reason why I dislike, and in fact, hate these terminologies is because they're misleading. They mislead patients. Okay, so does that answer your question, Marcus? Yes, thank you. That, that answers is um, perfectly, and I would be scared looking at uh, those pictures if somebody tells exactly. me that knows. Um, and I think it's also important um, that you, subdivide those and I think that's that's I think the next um, subject you want to get to is um, you know what are the factors how do we diagnose um, um, exercise induced leg pain and in fact chronic and exertional compartment syndrome excellent so uh, how do I manage this uh, and it's based on uh, experience uh, literature review uh, evidence, uh, and of course, patient outcomes. Uh, and I think uh, as clinicians over the years, we have lost the trick of asking questions. In other words, taking a decent history, partly because we rely on investigations. Even today, um, I just to give you an example, uh, well, I probably won't, should give you an example because this is a, a, a that's a, it's a sportsman who's uh, high profile. Maybe I won't give that example on second thoughts, but we rely heavily on investigations to make a diagnosis. And the biggest culprit is the MRI scan. 
And we know MRI scan gives you more information than it's necessary. In leg pain, it, it can be disaster. <clears throat> so my trick has always been, and I think you learn to, to, to gather knowledge uh, and, and then ask uh, simple questions. Uh, John King taught me a lot and he taught me one thing. And he said, in order to make a diagnosis, especially in musculoskeletal medicine, so you can pick a foot, you can pick an ankle, you can pick a, pick a leg. Um, if you don't have knowledge of conditions that affect the leg, you can't ask effective questions. Because there are certain conditions and a couple of authors have already uh, produced some valuable papers, Joma Steiff on chronic exertional compartment syndrome, uh, where if you take a good history, you can almost be 90% certain that that's going to be the diagnosis. Uh, Marinus Winter, again, Scandinavian, uh, who has produced a fabulous paper in 2018, uh, looking at medial tibial stress syndrome. So on history alone, you can actually make those diagnoses. So the trick is to have knowledge of conditions and there aren't many that are commonly occurring in sportsmen. So we're not looking at disease processes. We're not looking at uh, atherosclerosis. Uh, we're not looking at peripheral ischemia or peripheral vascular disease. We're looking at young patients with normal anatomy, uh, no obvious disease or pathology that causes them disability whereby they cannot perform their, their, their activity. So knowledge of condition is a must. And I'm a fan of Socrates. And he said, knowledge is good, ignorance is evil. And I think this is absolutely true in leg pain. And this is another reason why I hate shin splints, because the minute you make that as a diagnosis, uh, you're showing ignorance. And uh, in fact, the evil bit comes when it costs patients a lot of money and they're no better. The other thing is anatomy, knowledge of the anatomy. Uh, leg is divided into four compartments. I've got a picture of it and I'll show you in a minute. Depending on where the patients get pain and depending on the, the, the knowledge you have will dictate what that condition might be. And of course, history is, is, the, is the foundation. If you have a rough idea of uh, the knowledge of uh, the conditions, you know the anatomy, you will ask some pertinent questions, which will then uh, tick the boxes of the condition you know. An examination pays a part, but not a big part. Uh, investigations are only there to confirm the diagnosis. So once you've taken a good history, you need one definitive dif diagnosis and at least two differential diagnoses based on your knowledge, anatomy and history. You confirm that with investigations, and then you can have a structured management. Because don't forget, in, in, in leg pain, often surgery is the only option. So you're not going to subject patients to unnecessary surgery uh, based on very limited uh, workup. Um, and then you may think about predisposing factors. And as you know, Marcus, at Queen Mary, uh, we work very much as a multidisciplinary team. And in leg pain, you need to establish a, a, a multidisciplinary team that consists of uh, an orthopedic surgeon with an interest in sport, rheumatologist, a radiologist, physiotherapist, a podiatrist, and of course, the kingpin, the sports medicine specialist, so a, a sports doctor. Uh, so you need about five or six people to then create a multidisciplinary team. And I often have multiple based on, on leg pains. So uh, there are four compartments in the leg, the anterior compartment. So if someone comes in with a specific history over the anterior compartment, uh, it could be one of three things. Chronic exertional compartment syndrome would be number one. Uh, tibialis anterior muscle uh, syndrome, which is a biomechanical anomaly, uh, but may mimic chronic exertional compartment syndrome. Uh, and 17% incidence of superficial perineal nerve entrapment syndrome. So straight away, you need to have knowledge of those three conditions. Uh, perineal compartments, that's the lateral compartment. 
Uh, deep posterior compartment consists of tibialis posterior and flexor group. Uh, and then you got the calf, which is gastrocnemius soleus, and let's not forget plantaris. This is an area where you've got to be really careful, the superficial posterior compartments, because there are so many different conditions that can affect it, from myopathy to uh, radiculopathy to nerve entrapment, myofascial tears, uh, accessory and low lying soleus syndromes, uh, and plethora of uh, intramuscular, intra uh, uh, fascia conditions. Uh, so compartment and anatomy makes a difference. I say to my students, these are the eight conditions you must have absolute knowledge about and you keep updating your knowledge. Uh, and as John King used to teach me and told me, if you have knowledge of these eight conditions and you ask specific con questions, all you're doing is ticking boxes in which condition that question or that answer uh, falls in. And whichever condition contains the most ticks is your primary diagnosis. Then you go through it. So in fact, it, you have to be a bloody good detective, but a detective with knowledge, uh, experience plus uh, uh, evidence. Um, we're gonna talk about chronic exertional compartment syndrome and I'm gonna focus on that. And, and please stop me at any time if I, if I ramble on, uh, because this is one area where I have a very keen interest in. Um, so we talk about chronic exertional compartment syndrome affecting the leg. Uh, but it also affects the foot. There are four compartments in the leg. There are nine compartments in the foot. And it also affects the forearm. Uh, there are four compartments in the forearm. Um, so forearm and uh, the foot are uncommon. And, and foot in particular, I probably have the largest series of 31 cases in the last 30 years. That means it's once a year. I'm either missing them or it is one of those conditions where you make a diagnosis based on uh, uh, eliminating all the other diagnoses. So for example, medial uh, foot compartment, you would have uh, looked at uh, FHL tendinopathy, uh, not of Henry tendinopathy, plantar fasciitis, nerve entrapments, tarsal tunnel. Uh, and when you've investigated them and exhausted those diagnoses plus treatment, you would then consider chronic exertional compartment syndrome. I think that's what happens. Leg in particular is, I think, because we have a lot of data on it, uh, because we've been researching it since the uh, 50s. Um, so uh, Mervor was the first guy in 1956 who didn't actually quite say chronic exertional compartment syndrome. He called it anterior tibial syndrome uh, in a division one Aberdeen player. Uh, and he did the fasciotomy uh, and returned him back to his sport. Uh, it wasn't until 1975 that we had a unified concept of what chronic exertional compartment syndrome was by Matson. And since then, there's been a number of researchers, Buranen, Mubarak, uh, our own Mike Allen, Mark Batt, uh, who have all had keen interest and have written papers on it. Um, so chronic exertional compartment syndrome, uh, once the history is uh, consistent with that diagnosis, uh, the only way to confirm it would be a dynamic intracompound pressure studies. And these are the pressure tracings you see. So just to get go back one step, so what is a classical history of chronic exertional compartment syndrome? Uh, so it'll be a, an athlete who's uh, young uh, in competitive sport, so always wants to better themselves, either in time, personal best for marathons, for example, uh, gets pain in the anterior compartment. It's always bilateral, it's never unilateral. Pain usually occurs within uh, 10 to 15 minutes of uh, walking fast or running. The key question, can you run through that pain? There are many conditions patients can run through, for example, MTSS. In chronic exertional compartment syndrome, the answer is always no. They cannot run through that pain, they have to stop. 
So next question would be, when do you, when you stop? How long does it take for the pain to go? Or it's instantaneous, within minutes the pain goes, and I can start again. And as they start, the same thing happens, so cyclic symptoms. Uh, and it gets to a point where it gets really bad, where they cannot do anything. But rest makes it better. They have no pain at rest, there are no nocturnal symptoms, and there's no sleep disturbance. If you examine their legs, they'll be normal. There's no obvious swelling. Sometimes they may present with a muscle hernia, but that's not indicative of chronic exertion or performance. Um, there'll be no color or temperature change. And the other key question I ask, do you get cramps in this compartment? And the answer is always no. So what do you feel? I feel tightness. That can actually differentiate between tightness and cramp. And that's in keeping with what happens because as they exercise, the pressure builds up within a, a closed compartment. When that pressure builds up, the theory and understanding is that it reduces the perfusion to the muscle at microcirculation level. It doesn't compress the large blood vessels as it does in popliteal artery entrapment syndrome. It reduces the perfusion to the muscle and you know what happens then. Uh, excretion is affected. Uh, there's no muscle nutrition's coming, glucose, oxygen. Uh, so in a way, you, you get uh, uh, ischemia. Not proven. It's been shown in animal studies, but not on human beings. Uh, for obvious reasons, you can't do these invasive tests on a, on, a, on, a, on a human being. Ethics simply will not allow it. So when they stop, the pressure reduces. The physiology returns back to normal, and, and, and they get pain relief. The other interesting thing, Marcus, is we don't really know what is the cause of pain in chronic exertional compartment syndrome. Is it ischemia uh, or is it uh, other neuropeptides being produced uh, within the, the various uh, uh, structures of the compartment? It's not a homogenous compartment. There are tendons, there are blood vessels, there are nerves, there is fascia, there's muscle. Uh, so it's not a homogeneous uh, structure. And recent study by Laura et al., Heinz Laura, who, who did a microdialysis, uh, it was a pilot study of 12 subjects with chronic exertional compartment syndrome in six controls who were asymptomatic. Um, and they looked at things like glucose, glutamate, and glycerol uh, lactates to see the whole spectrum of uh, pain mediators, as well as uh, something that may accumulate in the muscle because there's poor excretion. Uh, and they found that uh, there were no differences between the two groups. Um, so we're still struggling with what's the mechanism of pain. Uh, so if someone comes in with a good history uh, of chronic exertional compartments you know, affecting the anterior compartment, uh, you would want to do a dynamic intracompartment pressure test. Now, there are different systems available. Uh, there are needle manometers, which is a common one that people use, and they devise their own criteria, what is optimum pressure, intracompartment pressure at rest following exercise. Uh, personally, um, I don't like those systems. So as part of my PhD, we, we, we designed our own. And this was based on what Mike Allen uh, had uh, designed in Leicester at the time. And I think there are about three or four systems available in UK uh, who give the information that you see. So what are the sort of information you need from an intracompound pressure studies? I think to just get one figure of uh, pressure, uh, which could be maximum pressure, mean pressure, uh, or relaxation pressure is simply not good enough. So from this graph, first thing I want to see, and my cursor is showing, is that I have cannulated this compartment. I threaded in a catheter, which is link, linked to a pressure transducer, which is then linked to a computer. I want to ensure that that catheter sits in the compartment uh, that I want to test. So RA is the right anterior, right deep posterior, left anterior, left deep posterior. I can actually, uh, uh, squeeze that compartment and get this deflection, which tells me 
that the catheter is in the right compartment and it's patent, meaning it's not blocked. One in five catheters get blocked, either through muscle or, 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 or a blood clot at the tip of the catheter. Um, and if that happens, then you, you will get abnormal pressure reading. Either you get a flat line uh, or it will be increased to uh, before uh, the catheter got blocked. So that's number one. I want to know whether it's patent or working. So I need a graph. I often say, if you had an ECG, and you didn't get a graph, how do you know what's wrong with the heart? And this is no different because essentially what you're looking at is ischemic or, or pressure related problem in, in the leg uh, where you want to know the characteristic of how the pressure is behaving on activity. So doing before and after rest is in my book not good enough and I'll come to that in a minute. The second bit I need to know is what are the mean pressures? Now, the normal mean pressures are based on data people have collected throughout the world. And I think in the leg, we have a lot of data. In the foot, not so much, and, and not so much for other compartments in the leg. So we have a dearth of data on anterior compartment, but not so, many so much data on perineal, superficial, and deep posterior. Uh, so I need to know what the mean pressure is. Does the peak pressure mean a lot? Uh, John and I discussed this on a number of occasions. And we said, no, it doesn't because the pressure is not constant at that level for a long period of time to create a, 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 an effect in the leg. So, but the mean pressure is, uh, so we need to know the mean pressures. And again, Joma Steiff has done a lot of work on relaxation pressure. So you get peaks um, with uh, contraction of the muscle and you get troughs these things uh, with relaxation of the muscle. And, and there's a lot of data on that, again, from Scandinavia, on, on what the normal relaxation pressures are. And, and they are average around eight to 12 millimeters of mercury. So that's important. What's the other important thing? The resting pressure. So I can exercise the patient to as much as I want, but I want them to then sit down and have a rest in a pre exercise position, which is literally sitting on a couch with legs dangling. If the pressure drops back to baseline, then that's a normal resting pressure. If it's increased in any way, uh, then that's an abnormal situation. So from this graph, I can look at mean, relaxation, and resting pressure. And I can also make sure that there are patients. This is important. And this is one of the problems we have in confirming diagnosis uh, in the leg, where people have used other systems where there isn't that kind of scrutiny of what the pressures are. So uh, Osama Avid, you might know, he was a student uh, uh, back in 2011, 2012. Uh, as part of his MSc, he did a systematic review with meta-analysis uh, of uh, recommendations for intracompound pressure monitoring in diagnosing chronic exertional compartment syndrome. Uh, and this was, uh, he looked at lots of papers. Uh, a lot of them were thrown out on, on the first uh, uh, look. And, and his conclusions were that all these criteria that are put forward are, are largely uh, unreliable. The only one that had shown any bit of reliability were the Steiff uh, data because they were conducted in, in a more controlled manner. Uh, and the emphasis remain mainly on good history, unless you do you use a dynamic system uh, like the one I use, like like uh, Alan used. So that's num that's again a problem problem for us because we, we don't actually have proper criteria of uh, diagnosing uh, pressure values, which are supportive of the diagnosis. And this is something that John and I also noticed that uh, if you use a standard protocol for uh, looking at pressures, so the, the, the uh, Pedovitz criteria is uh, needle manometer, at rest, patient lying on a couch, stick it in the compartment, look at the pressure, and then they go and exercise uh, uh, for 15 minutes, check it again, and then every other five minutes. 
uh, but it said rest. Patients are lying on a couch. What you want is, is to monitor pay, uh, pressure whilst the patients are actually doing their activity. So here on the top left uh, is a skater, a professional skater. And this is how they train on this map. And he only got pain when he skated. He didn't get pain when he was running or walking uh, in the anterior compartments. Uh, so we tested his pressure and we looked at him running, walking, and they were normal. When he skated, the pressure went down. And equally with all the other sports, a tennis player, a cyclist, ballerina, a swimmer here, we, we mimicked his strokes, uh, jigging up this. Uh, Tom Crisp, you, you know, a very good friend of ours. Uh, we had an underwater hockey player who got pain only whilst doing underwater hockey. So we sent her up to Mike Allen at the time, who was more experienced than I am, and, and he mimicked underwater hockey a situation for her and looked at pressure. The pressures went up. So again, another thing we need to incorporate in our diagnostic uh, workup to make sure that you test pressure, look at pressures during their activity. And then it comes to treatment. So if you can imagine a patient who's been diagnosed as shin splints has been treated with all sorts of conservative treatment, I can guarantee you the two that would include physiotherapy and orthotics, and they're no better. In fact, one of the side studies that I did when I was doing my PhD uh, was to look at what would be the effect of orthotics on intracompartment pressure if a patient had chronic exertional compartment syndrome. Uh, and we use off the shelf orthotics. So we uh, had an abstract, but we never actually published the full data, uh, fear of being litigated by various orthotic companies. Uh, because the orthotic we used were one set, and we couldn't be sure that all orthotics would have the same detrimental effect on the pressure. Um, so, conservative treatment for chronic exertional compartment syndrome. Uh, yes, you can try physiotherapy, you can try all the things that, and if it works, well and good. If it doesn't, uh, then uh, you, you've got other options. Uh, Botox, uh, in my view, uh, shows promise, but uh, I think in UK we are a bit more cautious. In the States, I think it's widely used. Uh, even in Spain, uh, one of uh, the sports doctors I was talking to, they've used it on, on, VA, on VA players with good success. Uh, but there are no proper studies, controlled studies on these. So I think in UK we're a bit cautious. I, I, I'm certainly very cautious because my experience with Botox was when working with a, another fabulous orthopedic surgeon, Mark Patterson, who looked after cerebral palsy children with dreadful uh, contractual and restrictive uh, conditions. And he used to use Botox for that, and it, it worked for those patient groups. But I'm not going to preach whether conservative management help work or not. If it works on your patients, uh, fine. Uh, in, in my view, uh, surgery is the only option. So again, Marcus, uh, we, we have to be very definitive of our diagnosis uh, so that if you're gonna subject these patients to surgery, uh, then uh, there is good evidence to, to say surgery would work in some of these cases. In fact, with fasciotomy, there's about 15% failure rate. And, and the failure rate is dependent on one thing, and I'm gonna discuss this, which I think is very important. Not as a, as a question. Imagine, go on. As a question, um, how, how many, um, are there any papers which say um, how many would fail uh, conservative treatment or would you say all of them fail the treatment? Um, that's, that's where the, there is no uh, evidence uh, because the people who uh, have presented papers uh, have termed some of these conditions differently. So here is a biomechanical overload syndrome. Um, and whether that exists as a syndrome or not, I'm not sure. Uh, but there are no uh, studies, and this could be a very good systematic review to see how conservative management works. Um, in my book, um, and in my practice in a way, I see patients who not got better 
So when I look at them, and they have chronic exertional compartment syndrome, and they've been through all these treatments, uh, that to me tells me that they don't work. The, the other, um, the other um, conservative treatment um, I'm hearing about is the running retraining. I don't know if you have any experience with that. I, I do, and I think what they're referring to is the anterior tibialis uh, muscle syndrome, which they're confusing with chronic exertional compartment syndrome, because the symptoms are, are they mimic each other. And I, I think there is a, a very good case to be made for uh, uh, retraining uh, those athletes and those patients. Uh, but how do you retrain someone who gets chronic exertional compartment syndrome uh, just on walking and, and to try and change their technique uh, without introducing orthotics. Uh, and, and I'll be very cautious about using orthotics is if they've got chronic exertional compartment syndrome, uh, you could effectively make it worse. So uh, again, uh, an area where it, it is looking into. A very good question. Thank you. So you can imagine you've gone through a good history, you've done a good workup, you've got a diagnosis, and you're pretty certain, almost 95% that that's what the, the, who do you refer to or what is the, the knowledge base of that surgeon who's gonna operate? And I've seen this over and over again. Uh, patients who have fasciotomy from uh, knee to the ankle. And as you know, uh, when you did surgery in your training, the longer the incision, the, the more risk you're going to get. Uh, and this is what happens, the adhesives. Uh, so we've just added uh, another problem of scar tissue for this patient. And he probably need uh, plastic surgery and further surgery uh, for, for a condition that was literally uh, activity related and activity disabling. Um, you don't want a surgeon who's not going to stitch up. Uh, they, they, put, they put in uh, uh, staples. So even moving your big toe on this patient, every time the staples move, it causes pain. So what is the key thing with the post-operative rehab? And this is where, where John King and Dave Goodyear and we have looked at it in greater detail. That post-op rehab calling fasciotomy is very important. And in order for that most of rehab to be effective, you need small scars. So these are John's hands, and he, he did hundreds of these operations. Uh, these are ancient sessions. Uh, if the patient is tall, then he would do three. So under this skin, he would uh, do a fasciotomy from the knee to the ankle. So you're not actually making a big incision on the skin, but you're doing an effective, uh, complete fasciotomy. Of that compartment. Um, and, and this is our post op rehab and return to sport. Uh, so, as soon as they're out of anesthesia, uh, I'm not going to go through the complete list, but just to give you a brief thing, as soon as they're out of anesthesia, they start dorsiflexing the foot. So, to keep the compartment open. So, even when they're recovering in recovery room, uh, as long as there are no drains, because bleeds can occur in these uh, uh, operations. If they've got drains, then you can't do any activity. Uh, physios would often give them crutches, uh, but I say to all my patients, leave the crutches at, uh, in the hospital and walk on them. So they're actively walking. But then there's a fine balance between recovering from, a hot, from the operation. Uh, so you need to effectively reduce the swelling, uh, which can happen because effectively what you've, in, what you've increased is the gravitational force. So therefore edema may occur. So it's a question of fine balance between resting and exercising, but they can exercise whilst they're resting. So that's one thing. So don't active, uh, active dorsiflexion, plantar flexion. As soon as the stitches come out, they start actively uh, getting on a treadmill uh, and that's within two weeks. So within six weeks, they should be back in their sport. And that was part of a study which we didn't publish because the, the doctor who conducted the study didn't want it published. He, he fell out with us, so he, he refused to get it published. But it was a, a review of 54 cases that John had operated on. 
and 85% success, 15% failed. Because when we actually looked at that data and we created this criteria for rehab was based on that 15% failure, where patients simply did nothing, they actually rested it. Some obviously developed complications, infection in one case, uh, and in two or three cases, there was increased swelling, so they couldn't exercise. But this is a very important aspect of the whole condition. It doesn't stop there, Marcus. So over the last 31 years, um, I've had 39 differential diagnoses of patients who have who were referred to me with either shin splints or compartment syndrome. And, and these are some of the conditions patients had. So it's not just about having knowledge of the eight. When it doesn't fit those eight, you've got to think outside the box. You've got to think of other conditions. So this is where you start to review patients on a, on a systematic review. So you start to look at their uh, endocrinology, for example, uh, vitamins, etc. So it doesn't just stop at eight. Uh, and these are the eight. Uh, these are the thirty-nine conditions that uh, can cause pain. And these are conditions that affected young athletes. These aren't people who were non-sport. So, in summary, if hammer is all you have, that's all you're going to see is a nail. Yeah. So the take-home message is: know your knowledge, know your anatomy knowledge. Take a good history, spend good time taking good history, support it with investigations, uh, whether it's MRI, CT, bloods, or dynamic intracompile pressure studies, and then have a structured management. And if you are unsure about what the structured management would be, have an MDT. I was born and brought up in Africa, Asante Sana in Swahili means thank you. Marcus, I'm delighted you asked me to do this. Uh, this is a subject I can talk until the cows come home. Um, but I'm delighted you asked me. Well, pleasure, and thank you, uh, Nat. I think, um, you know, I still wanted to um, get one answer um, for one question is, is surgery always necessary? Surgery is not always necessary, no. Um, there are cases uh, we discuss chronic exertional compartment syndrome, and I'm happy to come back and discuss some of the other eight conditions, uh, or we can get some specialists to talk about it. No, surgery is not always needed. And John, as you probably know, was a proponent of keeping away from surgery as much as possible. But there are some conditions, if you nail the diagnosis, on objective findings is absolutely necessary. So conditions like chronic exertional compartment syndrome, uh, popliteal artery entrapment syndrome, as long as it's type one to four. Uh, type five, type six is a difficult one. Uh, you need to know the anatomical defect that you can uh, repair or reduce to then uh, get a leg uh, to be normal. Uh, conditions like myopathies, Mercado syndrome, uh, conditions like re uh, radiculopathy, superficial perineal nerve entrapment, uh, other nerve entrapment, serial nerve entrapment, common perineal nerve entrapment, um, do not need surgery. You, you can manage them uh, conservatively. Uh, often requires injections. Uh, as you know, uh, Otto Chan. Uh, who's pioneered lots of these injections for different conditions, um, and, and we do get them better. Recently had a case uh, of uh, tibialis posterior nerve entrapment due to an old uh, muscle tear uh, in, in, a, in a very, uh, I wouldn't say elite, but she was a very, very keen uh, Ironman, uh, and in the last two years has not been able to run uh, and has been treated for different things, but not got better. And we rec recently decompressed that scar tissue space to release the nerve. I think we'll, we'll be about 50, 60% uh, uh, 
it'll be 60 for 50 percent better uh, but eventually i think she'll need surgery to release the nerve properly uh, by a peripheral nerve surgeon um, so no i think I, I think your question is absolutely right uh, we don't always offer surgery but this is where the diagnostic and workup matters because you've got to have a definitive diagnosis and literature has to support that surgical treatment is the best for that condition. If it doesn't, and if there are doubts, keep well away from surgery. What I haven't shown in this lecture is the number of cases where they had surgery for presumed conditions. And one of them is chronic exertional compartment syndrome, where they actually did not have compartments, chronic exertional compartment syndrome. Um, so yes, I think you've got to be careful with offering surgery. Got to be offered to definitive diagnosis. Well, that, I thank you for this um, great uh, overview. I certainly have learned a lot. And uh, uh, like always, you know, history is everything. Make a good diagnosis. And, Absolutely. Um, I think that's where we leave it. I, I'm, I think we're going to get those papers in the in the, uh, in the in the blurb of this video. Um, um, and um, if anybody wants to find Nat, so uh, he's at uh, Queen Mary University of London and um, London um, Sports Wise, isn't it? London. London Sports Wise. But you, you can, you, I mean, you can Google me and you'll, you'll find my profile. Um, and if anybody wants any papers on any aspect of leg pain, I, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to send. I've just noticed I've signed in as my son, Kieran Padia. <laughs> He's a okay. medical student at QMUL as well. <laughs> okay, Nat. Uh, thank you for this. And um, thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Thank you.